company of prophets. African American psychics, healers, and visionaries. Written by Joyce Elaine Knoll. Read by Leo Hill. After that, thou shall come to the hill of God, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Samuel chapter 10 verses 5 through 10 Preface Four o'clock in the morning the hour of God, but also the time of vulnerability. Along some routes, this is a favorite hour to clean buses. Roused from sleep, we stumbled down into the darkness, half-formed, so wispy our connections to our bodies, so in our own universes, that we were the dotted figures in childhood activity books, lacking the proper lines to impinge as real. My journey to gather material for this book was made mostly by bus. It was the way in which I could best afford to travel, and it was certainly the only direct passage to many places. I made four cross-country trips. Bus riding was familiar enough to me. As a child, I rode southbound buses from Harlem for more than a decade to visit my grandparents in Virginia. Once through the Holland Tunnel, man-made structures gave way to the wonder of the non-concrete, to flowing space at eye level. It seemed to me space spread in all directions in an absoluteness, blending in were stands of trees, cornfields, farm buildings, and small towns not violating space with their presence. My joy, too, was in feasting from what seemed a bottomless shoebox, packed with a wonderful assortment of picnic goodies by my mother. And there was singing. Hour after hour, my two sisters, cousin, other young passengers, and I sang the hit tunes of the day, with the driver and adult passengers indulging us at least most of the time. Those memories all had their part in strengthening my decision to travel by bus. Pilgrims, as travelers used to be called, 
would often receive a benediction prior to their setting out. I always got a good send-off for my husband and children. But in El Paso, on my third trip out, during the midday rest stop, I crossed over to the convention center, inexplicably drawn to it. Seizing, I thought, an opportunity to be apart from the chaotic current that mobilizes a bus station, I hurried toward the restroom, ostensibly to wash away road grime, before doing a quick tour of the center's art gallery. A group of five women was already there in the ladies' lounge, and I exchanged greetings with them. Upon learning of the nature of my trip and the subject matter of my intended book, they showed sudden spiritual excitement. They spontaneously formed a prayer circle around me, and there, in that improbable location, for an appeal for a divine intervention, the bathing and toileting facilities of the Texas Convention Center, I received their blessings and good wishes for a safe trip and a successful project. I left El Paso feeling restored and well enough that I should. They were part of a southwestern charismatic Catholic convention. The bus and its stations usually served as my main hotel accommodations. I would draw as many interviews from a town as possible and then rush for the evening bus. But after two or three nights of sleeping on buses, I needed a bed and full bathing facilities. I usually stayed in hostels, and they, in their many regional variations, proved to be secure places. College dormitories were greatly sought by me for lodging, but they were seldom available. Most colleges seem to have problems accommodating their own student bodies, let alone mine. I was fortunate in being able to arrange for quarters at Fisk University, in the same building where the Jubilee Singers had lived. As the only person lodged on the top floor of that old building, I thought I might have an encounter with one or more of those esteemed historical, although deceased, performers. But even my sleep was dreamless, and interrupted only by a co-ed coming upstairs to use the hall telephone. The individuals whose stories I heard and read during these travels and in my research are adherents of many different religious faiths, belief systems, and practices. They have a variety of lifestyles and come from diverse socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. But in common, they have these characteristics. Identity within the African American culture, native-born United States citizenship status, and substantial and definitive psychic abilities. Very little information is available concerning this particular population. Those United States-born African Americans having extrasensory perception. The existing data are scattered mostly through magazines and newspapers. This book is an effort 
to provide a more comprehensive and focused view. My main intent in writing Company of Prophets is to provide overdue acknowledgement to a group of people who have essentially been ignored. I began my search in the fall of 1983 with an interstate USA bus pass, a few referrals and leads. I headed away from home and California. In my search, in addition to finding opportunities to interview contemporary individuals, I hoped to unearth historical material on that population as well. The material for this book was gathered from personal and telephone interviews, books, newspapers, and magazine articles. There were heartening occurrences during my travels. Conversations overheard in the most unconnected of places resulted in an enrichment of my store of information and in one instance led to a significant interview. A book randomly pulled from a library shelf on several occasions presented a new personality or provided the basis for a sketched image suddenly to become defined and locatable. However, a number of disappointments are sorely remembered. I missed people whom I had traveled several days to see. Our signals were misunderstood. There were also prospective interviewees who couldn't comprehend what I was doing or feared for their privacy and so declined interviewing. Fortunately, these were very few in number. The warm reception, the hospitality, the encouragement and blessings bestowed upon me across the country by other African Americans in telling their stories to the stranger constitute the creation of a most singular lifetime experience. Not forgotten, either, is the generosity of resource people. A number of individuals around the country, both black and white, freely shared information, their own research materials, and sometimes their homes with me. The range of testimonies includes those of psychic counselors, historical figures, religious recluses, artists, children, and people of varying professions and disciplines. The individuals whom I interviewed all believed in a supreme spirit consciousness. Many followed traditional Western religions. Others studied the teachings of the East, and yet others belonged to New Age religions and groups. People of both religious and secular communities are presented here in a sequence of my own creation without reference to any hierarchical evaluation in terms of their station in life or state of being. This sequence is based solely upon carrying along a continuity of interest and description. Following a necessity for some form of guidelines and parameters, I have omitted charismatic religious leaders who may have or had psychic abilities. Their inclusion would have opened too wide a range for the particular purposes of this book. There seems to be ample material on many of these individuals already in circulation, 
continuously being made available. That an individual is mentioned more than once is not indicative that his or her abilities have greater quality or significance. Multiple inclusions reflect rather the person having a breadth and diversity of attributes which would be of interest to the general reader. Furthermore, the book is arranged not by individual identities, but by abilities, under which system an individual may be presented in more than a few sections. In terms of attitudes toward the material world held by people included in the book, I found a broad range of considerations regarding the acquisition and holding of worldly wealth. Some interviewed were quite intent upon creating a balance between the material and the spiritual. Others had little or no interest in the area of economics beyond how to survive in the world and in physical body while they continued their work. I had a set of questions, fairly basic ones, to use for the interviewing process. They were often answered before I could express them. Of specific interest to me was how individuals were using their gifts, such as whether they sought to realize goals through their supernormal powers, extending beyond desires for self-enhancement alone. Throughout interviews and research, I found that the desire to help others held strongly in this group. Many spoke of their struggles to articulate their gifts meaningfully into service for humankind. There were those, too, who believed they could not use their abilities for themselves at all, that their gifts would vanish if they were in any way to profit from them. As general terms, abilities, gifts, power, talent, spiritual gifts, and psychic gifts, all refer to extrasensory perception qualities. They also allude to those invisible channels of thought and spirit by which human beings can exercise an apparent power to affect physical matter, time, and space, and the minds of others. They are used interchangeably throughout this book. The marked and deep intuitivity in the African-American culture has long been generally known and implied through writings. Much of what has been written has concentrated on the mysticism and psychism of black people in Africa and the Caribbean. This book is one person's survey and view on the subject of U.S.-born blacks with advanced psychic abilities. This writing is only intended as a descriptive and not an all-inclusive effort. I only interviewed a small percentage of this population, and I undoubtedly missed a number of people whom readers may believe should have been included. I sincerely regret such omissions. I was fortunate in this project. Interviews and research were sometimes such intense being-to-being -being experiences that they affected my spiritual outlook profoundly. From these contacts, new 
realizations about myself and about existence surfaced in a greatly accelerated manner, leaving me breathless in their impacting clarity. Stirred from a long, held stance of wooden wondering and hesitation, I was inspired to move with greater resolution into fully immersing myself into living as myself. Company of Prophets is a compilation from the personal experiences of individuals exemplifying the ways that intuitivity and the power of spirit manifest through native-born African Americans. I had wandered among my own people to tap not the genetic roots, but the spiritual roots of the collective spiritual consciousness of my race, and as an unexpected consequence, I received healing through the power of that assembled and unified spirituality. Joyce E. Knoll, Oakland, California. July, August suns, summer. I touch, taste, smell, hear, see, command. Part of all, of the divisible totality. All of all, I am the sole reality. Infinite, untainted by self-doubt. Holy, whole. I, the scrawny, dark brown girl clad in yellow, caterpillar-striped swimsuit. Sweaty hot, restless. Sand gritty. Follow the right-hand path to the ocean. Propelled by cool winds at my elbows, knees. Inebriated with sacred curiosity. My back to the world of the red checkered tablecloth anchored by the wicker hamper laden with fried chicken, potato salad, watermelon pickles, cherries, punch and cookies. Escaping my mother's vigilant eyes, I renounce security and distance myself from the known. The surf's vibration draws, soothes me. The ocean explodes as we meet and I am anointed. The waves, though forbidden to snatch me seaward, spray, sting, roll, strangle, suck me under. Arising undaunted, I use my swimsuit to gather treasures, beamed up from the deep at my bidding. I am warrior s i am initiate 